Hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, I would like to, to come back with all those um, the presentations. My name is Pedro Sena and I, I am a PhD student of uh, botanic in botany in Universidad Federal de Pernambuco. And I am the support team of the workshop. And now I have the, the honor to introduce you to Diane Sherivasova. And I'm, I'm like to, I would like to introduce her talking that Diane is a professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Her research centers on the fundamental questions of community ecology, including those that help to develop the theoretical basis of conservation. Her research group investigates how the interaction of spatial and trophic process determines the species that occur within food webs and the consequence of the losses of the, those species for the ecosystem functioning through field experiments, surveys, and meta-analysis of published data. Also, much of her research takes place on in the tropics, especially Costa Rica and Brazil, where she mostly studied bromeliad systems. So um, it's a great pleasure to have you here, uh, Dr. Diane, and it's all on you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure today uh, to talk to you. My name is Diane Trevastava, and um, I look forward to telling you about some of the research that's been going on in my lab group or in collaborations on how climate change can reshape and rewire uh, food webs. So I want to start by telling you why I love food webs. So if you're interested in uh, how uh, any particular driver affects an ecological system, uh, food webs uh, have something for everybody. They summarize a lot of different information, uh, such as information on uh, how uh, population sizes can change, how the relative abundance of species can change, um, how the interactions between species can change, uh, including even indirect effects propagated through multiple links, uh, also the uh, effects on uh, traits through association of traits with nodes or species in the food web, and also about how uh, ecosystem processes can change uh, if we envision the nodes as stocks of energy or elements and the links as flux between these stocks. So all of these perspectives on food webs, I'm going to talk about today um, to think about why food webs are uh, such nice systems to study responses to climate change. Um, I want to introduce two terms in today's talk. Uh, that is the terms of rewiring and reshaping. So by rewiring, I mean a change in the strength or the existence of links uh, between nodes in the food web. Uh, here are two particularly nice examples that are um, illustrated by Bartley et al. in their recent uh, review of climate change effects on the rewiring of food webs. Um, in both of these examples, there is a vertical temperature gradient which is intensified as the climate warms, as you go from left to right in both diagrams. And in each case, this uh, affects the top predator. The top predator moves down uh, within the habitat. In the case of the trout, uh, this affects the relative uh, importance of offshore fish versus nearshore fish in its diet. In the case of the canopy spiders, um, they actually move down so far that they a totally new interaction develops and that is predation on the, um, the bottom, the ground dwelling uh, spider, an example of intragill predation. So the reshaping of food webs is a bit different. By reshaping, I mean changes in the distribution of biomass between trophic levels. So here we have two examples, both from freshwater systems uh, and both involve a natural uh, range of temperature. So the temperature gradient goes from cold on the left to warm on the right. And in both the streams and the bromeliads, the food webs become dominated by lower trophic levels in warmer climates. So if there's such lovely examples of rewiring of food webs and reshaping of food webs, you may wonder 
what I'm going to be talking about for the remainder of this talk. Well, I'll put the argument out there that we're actually just at the beginning of uh, starting to grapple with how climate change can affect food webs. And in particular, I see three challenges ahead of us. So the first challenge is moving past just observations of um, the reshaping of food webs to understanding the underlying mechanism. So here we have in front of us an example of um, on the left, a food web uh, before some sort of climate stressor event. Uh, the middle is during the climate stressor event. And then the right hand side is the food web after that event and the food web has adjusted to it. So you can see that the green, the resource species have changed in relative abundance, but they change for very different reasons. So for example, uh, a resource species could increase because its consumer is directly affect by, affected by climate and has decreased. Uh, a resource species could also increase because per capita consumption on, on it has decreased. Uh, there's also other possibilities I've not shown that could be a direct positive effect of climate on one of those resource species increasing it. There could also be very complicated indirect effects that propagate, propagate through multiple links. Um, so for example, here we see an example of, indirect, of um, apparent competition uh, where um, one resource species actually decreases because of uh, changes in other links in the food web. The second challenge is to dig more into the climate side of the equation. So um, there are multiple facets of climate change. Uh, you know, there's not just one thing that's climate, it's at a very bare minimum, it's precipitation and temperature. But even here we could dig deeper. So of course precipitation uh, can be quantified in different ways. Uh, it can be quantified in terms of the total amount of rainfall, but it can also uh, be important how that rainfall is distributed over time and space. And many organisms do not um, experience climate directly. Instead, they uh, experience the abiotic consequences of climate. So suppose you're an animal in a small pond, like the one I've shown here. You probably don't notice the rain on your back, but you would notice changes in the pond that are mediated by changes in rainfall and temperature. So for example, you might be quite sensitive to things like drought or the drying up of the, of the pond or flushing of the pond or even changes in the habitat size of the pond uh, because of differences in the input and the output of water. So the challenge is to incorporate into our experiments and our analyses uh, some of the complexity uh, in climate and the abiotic consequences. And then the third challenge is about scale. So we're necessarily restricted to doing experiments at fairly small spatial scales, at local scales, and over uh, fairly short uh, time scales in most cases. However, we're often interested in predictions that occur at much larger spatial scales, maybe regional scales, and over longer time frames. So how far can we apply the results of any particular experiment? In other words, what I'm asking about is what is the geographic prediction horizon? And if that horizon is really small, how can we make it larger? So these are very big questions. And I'm hoping that we can get some insight on these big questions from this rather small plant that you see in front of you. This is a bromeliad. Uh, bromeliads are ubiquitous across the neotropics. And many species of bromeliads are able to impound or collect water between their leaves, which are tightly interlocked at the leaf bases, forming watertight compartments. Um, these compartments can be colonized uh, by invertebrates, particularly insects, uh, which are larvae in the, um, in the bromeliads. And because they're larvae in the bromeliads, for the period of their larval lifespan, this is their entire world. 
So this is a small miniature world uh, that is really amenable for experiments, whole, whole uh, food web experiments. Um, so this is what makes Verminiad's nice model systems for ecology. The other thing that makes it nice is we know a lot about the invertebrates. So they can be divided into different fun feeding functional groups, as I've shown you here. And those functional groups can be arranged in the form of a food web. So here's a generalized food web. It starts at the bottom with basal resources, which most of the time are dominated by detritus, things like uh, dead leaves that fall into the bromeliad. So this detritus is colonized by bacteria and fungi, and this combination of bacteria and fungi in the detritus is uh, eagerly consumed by a suite of detritivores. The detritivores uh, consume detritus in different ways. So shredders have these, um, these shearing mouth parts. They're able to uh, slice up uh, the um, intact leaves. Scrapers skeletonize the dead leaves. Whereas collectors uh, basically sweep up all the leftovers, all the fine particulate matter. Meanwhile, in the water column, there's a rich assemblage of microbes, including things like ciliates, rotifers, flagellates, um, which are uh, fed upon by filter feeders, uh, almost entirely mosquito larvae. And both the filter feeders and the detritivores themselves are prey for a rich suite of uh, predatory species, some of which prey on each other. And so there's intraguild predation in the predator level. Okay, so knowing that, we can move to the first question. So the first challenge I set was to start to disentangle some of the complexity of mechanisms, to disentangle the direct effect on species versus the indirect effects that are realized through altered species interactions. So a lot of our research is done in Costa Rica. Um, so in Costa Rica, unfortunately, is going to lead the world in terms of precipitation change, in terms of both reduced and more variable precipitation. And in fact, uh, one of our long-term field sites uh, that I'm going to describe experiments from first is located in Guanacaste, where we're already starting to witness this increase in rainfall variability. Now, bromeliads are, of course, aquatic systems. And so, as small aquatic systems, they can dry out. On the left-hand side, I'm showing you a year in the life of a single bromeliad. So there's uh, three different colored lines on this graph. Those are uh, the water depths in three different marked leaves on a single bromeliad. And the red arrows are when at least one of those leaves completely dries out. And so you can see that this drought occurs multiple times during the year. And it occurs more frequently in small bromeliads. On the right hand side, you can see that bromeliads um, under about 100 mils of total capacity uh, regularly dry out, whereas those over 100 mils uh, rarely do. So bromeliad size matters in terms of drought, and insects know this. So now I'm going to describe some work that was carried out by Sarah Amandrud. Um, you'll see a lot of work by Sarah in this presentation because she did both a master's and a PhD in my lab. And so what we did is we uh, designed metrics of drought sensitivity and habitat sensitivity. So two independently determined metrics. Drought sensitivity, we um, uh, had experiments where uh, insects were subject to drought at various lengths and we looked at their survival rates. Uh, habitat sensitivity was the fun aspect here was uh, we had to account for the fact that uh, larger bromeliads contain more individual insects. And so uh, all species uh, tend to occur just through random chance more often in large than small bromeliads. So we have to account for that using a null model, um, which is what you see there. So if we, for each species, we calculate both its uh, preference for habitat size, its drought sensitivity, and we regress these two metrics against each other. And we see a surprisingly strong relationship here. So this suggests that um, species 
that are most sensitive to drought are found disproportionately in large ruminants. This could occur either because adults anticipate low survival in small ruminants and they oviposit preferentially in the large ruminants, or it could be differential survival. Now, in this general pattern, there's a lot of hidden stories. And I want to spend a minute telling you about some of the stories that have been developed by different members of my lab group. Let's start with the point that doesn't seem to fall on the line. And that is for why am I a mosquitoes? So this is really the exception that proves the rule. Um, because Wyomaya has a trick. It is the only species that has drought resistant eggs in this system. And so these eggs can essentially be dormant on the side of a dry bromenad until the moment the bromenad's full of water, at which case, at which point the uh, insect larvae uh, emerges and is the first one to be in the bromenad. Um, so it can occur in much smaller bromenad than you would expect from just looking at its larval uh, resistance to drought. This little trick uh, allows it to be in smaller bromeliads than many other species, such as other mosquitoes, such as the Culex mosquito you see here. And um, also its major predator, which is the damselfly larvae, Mesistogaster modesta. Now Culex, you notice, um, has to coexist with Mesistogaster modesta. So how does it do that? Well, when Ed Hamill was in my lab, he discovered the answer. Turns out that Culex can smell the damselfly. And when it smells it, it um, freezes, motionless, um, so that the damselfly cannot detect it. Now, what about the damselfly? Well, it occurs in bromeliads that are over 100 mil of capacity. Now, you will remember that 100 mil value from earlier in the talk. Um, Bromenads over 100 mils rarely dry out. And here we know how this incidence function occurs. It occurs through the wisdom of the adults. So adult females uh, will not oviposit in bromenads that are less than 100 mils. And adult males realize this. And so they defend territories around the largest bromenads. So that was insight that uh, Jackie and I, and I uh, uh, developed. Okay, so the effect on damselflies can be contrasted to another major player in today's talk, and that is the tipulid larvae. Tipulids are also called crane flies. And you can see that this is a particularly hardy species in terms of drought, and it uh, really isn't bothered one way or the other about the size of bromeliads. So now that you know something about the cast of characters, let's look at what happens when you take an entire food web and you expose it to drought of varying lengths. Now here, I'm not gonna show you all the details of the experiments. I'm just gonna um, give you an overview of the major results. So the first thing we found is that drought reduces uh, filter feeders, which are the mosquitoes and predators, which are the damselfly larvae. Um, this is not unexpected from what I've already told you about the drought tolerance of these two species. They're both sensitive to drought. Now, otherwise predators uh, consume all the other insects in the system, including the chronomids and the tipulids as well as the mosquitoes. So I've already told you that shredders are major agents of decomposition, which leads to nutrient release and uh, can lead to water stagnation. Um, and because shredders are immune to drought, but their predators are not, shredders, the tipulates, actually benefit from drought. So all of this is perhaps not unexpected, but there was one big surprise in this experiment. And that's these negative relationships from the shredding tipulate to the filter feeders and the collectors. This was completely unexpected. Um, up to that point, uh, we assumed that these uh, species were operating more or less on the same trophic level. So 
what's going on? Well, it turns out that those shredding mouthparts that are so good at chopping up dead leaves are also really efficient at chopping up other insects. The trouble is uh, when tipulids are in a three-dimensional habitat of, uh, formed by the water column, they just cannot get their mouth parts on other insects. They need the water to be removed to have a two-dimensional habitat. And there, as you can see in the graph, consumption uh, dramatically increases on the insects. So this is the type of ecological surprise that we should anticipate um, in the land of climate change. So that brings us to the next challenge. So, so far we've talked about drought, but how about all the other facets of climate change? How does that actually interact with drought and in particular with this uh, facultative predation effect that I've just described? So I want to tell you two stories here. Uh, first, uh, a story about the current limits to species distributions, and then how we've used experiments to think about the future limits to species distributions. So if we're interested in uh, disentangling components of climate, perhaps one of the best ways to do this is by going to a mountain. So mountains are like natural laboratories for this type of question. So I'd like to introduce you to the mountain of Monte Verde, also in Costa Rica. It's south of the Guanacaste site uh, that I just talked about. And uh, like most mountains, it's cold at the top and warm at the bottom. And that holds, doesn't matter what side of the mountain you're looking at. So if you look at the temperature uh, inset graph, you'll see that the change in temperature with elevation is the same on both the Pacific and Atlantic sides of the mountain. But the rain comes from the Atlantic side. And so the Atlantic side is very wet and the Pacific side is very dry. And you can see this in terms of relative humidity on the two sides, where the two sides diverge and the humidity gradient along elevation. So again, this work was done by uh, Sam, Sarah Amandrud, um, in this case for her uh, PhD. And what she and her team of um, very hardy field assistants did is tromp up, up and down both sides of the mountain, uh, surveying uh, bromine and vertebrates. So here's uh, some of the most common species in the community. Now I know there's a lot going on there, but the there's just two species that I want you to focus on, and I've color coded them for you. So the damselflies are the reddish brown uh, dots where they occur, or X's where they don't occur, and tipulids are the blue dots. So the first thing you'll see is the distribution is totally different for these two species. Damselflies only occur on the wet, the Atlantic side of the mountain, um, and at low elevation sites. Uh, so this confirms uh, what we've seen before in uh, a species distribution model, for example, that Sarah and Martin Videla uh, and I did, where damselflies are really uh, affected by uh, both precipitation and temperature. By contrast, tipulids occur up and down uh, both sides of the mountain. Okay, so uh, moving beyond these two species, if we look at the Atlantic side, we see that the preferred elevation um, of species in general correlates quite well with their thermal tolerance. That is, species with lower thermal tolerance tend to be restricted to the top of the mountain. Now that this uh, pattern gets a little fuzzier on the Pacific slope. So we wanted to know if the dynamics of the food web actually changed between uh, these two sides of the mountain. And to do this, we use structural equation models here. So let me take a minute to walk you through how these models are set up. In all cases, we're looking at the effect of elevation on a focal species. Each row represents models for a different focal species. So for example, the top row, the focal species is Culex. And each column of this figure represents a different side on the mountain. So I'm gonna start actually with the Atlantic side, and then we'll talk about the Pacific side. So on the Atlantic side, elevation always has a strong direct effect on the focal species. You can see that elevation also affects the damselfly, but the damselfly does not go on to then transmit the effect of elevation onto the focal species. 
totally different pattern on the Pacific side. Here, elevation has no direct effect on the focal species. Elevation instead affects tipulates, and tipulates for two out of these three focal species then goes on to transmit these effects of elevation onto the focal species. So this type of result led us to wonder whether tipulates are going to be key levered species in determining the future of food webs on the Pacific side of the mountain. And to test this idea, we can design some experiments. Now, necessarily, these experiments are fairly complex because we are interested in how temperature, drought, evolution, and facilitated predation together combine to affect food webs. It would be easy to look at these in isolation, but we are anticipating strong interactive effects between them, which means we need to design a complex experiment that can simultaneously manipulate multiple climatic variables, prior exposure of species to future climatic conditions, so the opportunity for local adaptation, as well as species interactions with a particular focus on facultative predation. How do we do this? Well, bear with me because um, I'm, I'll walk you through this fairly slowly. Um, so uh, MV represents a site MV stands for Monteverde, a site at the top of the mountain. Currently, that site is experiencing cold and wet conditions because of a cloud layer that permanently lives on top of the mountain and creates cloud forest. However, in future, we're anticipating the climate of the site will resemble more that of the UGA uh, site. So UGA is a field station further down the mountain and its climate is warm and dry. So we can compare uh, the performance of species in these two sites as a space for time experiment. So specifically, we can move species from the top of the mountain to our experiment at the top of the mountain or our experiment at the UGA site. Now, the sites differ not only in temperature, but also in the amount of rainfall. Uh, we could uh, use that variation in rainfall to uh, try to get a drought treatment. However, rainfall um, and uh, drought in particular is very stochastic. Uh, so instead, it's uh, much better to independently manipulate drought. And we did this in uh, our experimental microcosm. So we started all microcosms uh, full of water. We then removed water from anywhere from zero to 22 days, so a gradient of drought. And then we filled up the microcosms again with water uh, until we got to the end of a, um, the experimental uh, period, which was a fixed duration. In addition, we wanted to know whether uh, the species could adapt to this future climate. So to, to look at this, we did a common garden experiment. So at the UGA site, we not only had uh, species from high up on the mountain, but we also had uh, populations that um, were found naturally at the UGA field site. The final uh, element of the design is species interactions. So our treatments included uh, tipulids or did not include tipulids. So that's what you see here. So to summarize, we have a common garden experiment nested within a space for time experiment. Okay, and the colors here represent the colors in the plots that I will show you. <clears throat> so the first thing that Sarah discovered is that total prey survival decreases as drought increases in length. So drought reduces prey survival, all those lines go down. 
but the lines go down more in the warmest site. And we can see this if we look at the partial effects. So here we have the partial effect on total prey survival in the two locations. And you can see that prey survival is much more affected by drought in the warm location. However, insect origin had no effect. In other words, the red and the green lines lie right on top of each other, statistically. So there's no role here for local adaptation, at least under the conditions of this experiment. The largest effect was the tipulates reduced prey survival. That is, the solid lines are always under the dashed lines. And again, we can see this if we look at the partial effects. So here we have uh, plots for each of uh, the uh, treatments. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that the green and the red plots, which are at the UGA site, the gap between the two lines is uh, even larger than it is at the, um, at the blue site, the Monte Verde site. So tipulates are again reducing prey survival under doubt, but especially at the warm site. And even more to the point, if we look at the difference between these sites, in the absence of tipulates, there's actually no different, no effect between the, no difference between the sites uh, um, over this drought gradient. By contrast, in the presence of tipulates, you see that the, uh, the warmest location has the strongest negative effect of drought versus the cold location. So uh, we're getting an effect of temperature primarily in the presence of tipulates when drought occurs as well. So a three-way interaction. So I know there is a lot of rich details there. Uh, let me summarize what I've just said in the format of a diagram. So um, here we've got uh, the setup. Uh, we've got various species of chronomids, various species of mosquitoes, and the tipulate. And uh, drought, but not temperature, has mild effects on the survival of the chronomid and the mosquito. Um, but the much bigger effect is the effect of drought on the interaction strengths leading to the tipulate. So uh, the predation of tipulates on chronomids and on mosquitoes. So the story on the Pacific side is really a story of rewiring of this food web. So now I want to take what we've learned in these local experiments um, and to extend it over different geographic scales. And at this point, we need to start um, thinking about how to uh, take all this knowledge that we've gained about the effects of drought and to link it to climate change. Because of course, there's no um, uh, uh, global model that is, predicts uh, the number of days a Bermuda is gonna be dry. Instead, um, climate models uh, predict rainfall. So we need to link uh, rainfall with drought, with the food web. So, we know through uh, the Bermuda Working Group um, that uh, Bermuda's experience drought not only when they're small, but also when the rainfall on the site is uh, both low and uneven. And let me show you exactly what I mean by that. So, here we have uh, seven different sites uh, throughout the uh, neotropics. And I'm going to focus on two of these sites, Costa Rica and Argentina sites. The Costa Rica site is the one in Guanacaste that I started the talk with. And here you can see in the histogram that um, there's, <clears throat> the histogram shows the um, number of days in different rainfall classes. And you can see that while there's many days it doesn't rain, there's also a number of days when it does rain. This contrasts with the Argentina site when most days it doesn't rain. Um, therefore, the Costa Rica site has on average higher mean daily rainfall, and that's what you see on the x-axis. You will also see that the distribution of days amongst these rainfall classes is very different. 
in particular in Argentina, most days it doesn't rain, but when it does rain, oh gosh, it really rains. Yeah. So it has a very uneven distribution. Um, so this is what you see on the rainfall dispersion axis. So now we know um, we have two different parameters for rainfall that are useful in characterizing the system. Uh, they're important for Bromeliad uh, drought. And uh, conveniently, they are both parameters from the negative binomial distribution, which ends up describing the rainfall data really quite well. So let's ask our question. Does the results of one site, does the results of experiments conducted at one site allow us to understand what's going on in other sites? How general or contingent are responses? So to ask this question, we worked as a large team. And by a large team, I, I mean a really large team. We had uh, 22 uh, researchers involved in this project and it occurred simultaneously uh, in seven different field sites with us all doing the same uh, rather complicated experiment in lockstep. And the experiment essentially is a response surface experiment. So we centered um, the treatments around the ambient conditions for each site. And then we tweaked both rainfall parameters in the same proportional way relative to those ambient conditions. The ambient conditions are shown uh, by the large solid dot. So let me zero in on the response surface for one of these field sites. So you can see what it looks like in real life. So here, the photo shows you uh, what one of these points looks like. So each point is its own bromeliad, and each bromeliad receives its own uh, personalized uh, rainfall schedule, which we operationalize with a watering can uh, the rain shelter over top is simply to remove natural rainfall so it doesn't um, interfere with our treatments. And during the experiment, we then measured water depth in um, the Bromeliad leaves to estimate metrics of hydrology, like um, the variation of water depth, the number of days the Bromeliad was dried out, and when it overflowed. And at the end of the experiment, we censused all the invertebrates uh, to establish the food web as well as sampling the bacteria and the protists and um, various ecosystem functions. For brevity today, I'm just gonna to talk to you about the invertebrate results. So the invertebrates, the invertebrates uh, had uh, variable responses to these rainfall treatments. On this graph, I've summarized the strength of the rainfall effect for each taxonomic family of invertebrates. So in brief, uh, this is the amount of deviance that's explained by the rainfall terms in the model, uh, uh, downweighted by the number of parameters. And you'll see that there's a lot of variation here. Um, the uh, family that was most affected was the mosquito family, the calicids. And uh, the tipulids that you see towards the bottom are less affected by rainfall. Again, uh, reinforcing what we've already learned about the relative uh, sensitivity of these two groups of species. But what I really want to draw your attention to are the colors on this graph. So purple refers to uh, taxonomic families that, shows, that showed a very contingent response. That is, their the effect of rainfall differed between sites. The orange dots, by contrast, refer to species or taxonomic families, <coughs> rather, that had a very general response. So you see the mosquitoes had a contingent response and the tipulates had a very general response. The gray dots are just where rain had no effect. <clears throat> so the amount of contingency suggests that we'd have trouble directly taking the results from one site and apply it, applying it to another site. But even if there was no contingency in the system, we would have trouble. And that's because sites differ in their composition, even in terms of taxonomic families, let alone species. Sites only have about uh, 32 to 80%, about half of their families in common. 
So we need to move from this taxonomic focus to um, metrics that have more universal uh, uh, applicability. So to do that, let's aggregate these taxonomic families into the functional feeding groups. So here are the functional feeding groups that you've seen before. Um, you know, we're particularly uh, interested in the in functional feeding groups in uh, as a response because they're really the mechanistic gateway to understanding ecosystem functions, um, and so they're basically based on uh, functional um, effect traits. So uh, now we can see uh, six different functional groups, but half of these six again show contingent responses. So to move forward we need to understand what's behind this contingency. And in brief, I'm gonna tell you about two ways that contingency enters the system. The first way is in the link between rainfall and hydrology. So, and this contingency occurs because sites differ in bromeliad size and in bromeliad shape, as you see in the photos below. So that means that the same amount of rainfall affects hydrology in different ways. So for example, variation in water depth is particularly affected by changes in mean rainfall in Argentina, but barely affected in the more humid site of French Guiana. The implication here is when you look at a metric, so let's take uh, the biomass of filter feeders, and you look at this as a function of rainfall, you find really idiosyncratic effects with again, Argentina dominating the pattern. But if instead you plot filter feeder biomass against hydrology with the rationale that hydrology is really the proximate uh, driver of changes in filter feeder performance, you get a much more consistent pattern. So for example, the inter the interaction with site, with rainfall, explained 55% of the variance. But for hydrology, it explains only 15% of the variance. So here you can see that uh, all of these lines go down. There's just two rogue bromeliads in the Macaé site that tend to keep that green line up. Uh, but overall, we get a fairly consistent effect of hydrology. Once we get rid of that high rain to hydrology con contingency. The second way that hydrology, uh, sorry, the second way that contingency occurs in the system is in the link between hydrology and the food web. And this happens because sites differ in their species pool. And as we've already talked about, species differ in their drought tolerances. In fact, if we look at the taxonomic families that occur in the species pool of each site, we already see the imprint of past and current um, uh, drought events. So here, what I've plotted is the species pool sensitivity to rain. And uh, this, I determined this is simply the weighted average of the sensitivity of all the component invertebrate families. And I've plotted this against uh, the proportion of days a bromeliad uh, is without water um, under ambient conditions. So you can see that the more often a bromeliad dries out under ambient conditions, uh, the less likely it is to have some of these sensitive taxa in its species pool to begin with, even before uh, um, imposing uh, climate change. So you might wonder, which of these two contingencies is most important? The short answer is, the more important contingency in our experiment is the first one, the effect of rainfall on hydrology. And we can see this uh, with a Mantell test. So each of the, the dots in this uh, plot represents a comparison of two sites. So the sites that are most different in their hydrologic sensitivity to rain, their hydrologic response to rain, um, are also most different in how their functional groups respond to rain. And now having um, looked at functional groups, we can go 
one higher level of aggregation. So uh, let's aggregate all the detritivore functional groups together, and let's aggregate all the predator functional groups together. And you'll notice that the detritivores are generally more sensitive than the predators are to rainfall. And so when you take the ratio of predators to detritivores, what we find is a overall, a general effect of rainfall on this ratio, which is often seen as a metric of trophic structure. In particular, as rainfall becomes more and more uneven, so as you go to the left of this diagram, the food webs, become dominated by the top predators because they're relatively um, impervious to drought, uh, leading to uh, top heavy biomass pyramids. Now, if you want to know more and more details about uh, the mechanisms that can be underlying this, I'll um, uh, direct you to uh, a recent paper uh, that we published. Gustavo Romero is the lead um, and it's just come out. So in conclusion, what I've the story I've talked about today in terms of uh, this multi-site experiment reminds me of something that John Lawton uh, once wrote. He said that it, meaning community ecology, is fascinating to study and rich in wonderful biology. But by studying it, do not expect universal rules, even simple contingent general rules to emerge. If and when they do, treasure them. So I think one of the um, important messages from the multi-site experiment is that we can figure out when we should get simple contingent general rules and when we should get universal rules. So to recap what I've gone over in this talk today, I talked about several ways that climate change can affect uh, bromeliad food webs. First of all, food webs will be reshaped when drought or temperature exceed species tolerances. You saw that uh, both within a uh, field site in terms of bromeliad size, but also over an elevational gradient in a mountain. Uh, I showed you that drought can lead to surprising changes in how species interact, leading to a rewiring of food webs. And this is an example of the type of ecological surprise uh, we should be prepared for in the time of climate change. Both of these effects occurred on a single mountain, though different effects dominated on each side of the mountain. I also showed you that rainfall um, affected the functional structure of the food web, but that this differed geographically due to hydrologic contingency. On the other hand, across the neotropics, food webs are universally reshaped because predators uh, were, as a group, more resistant to uneven rainfall. I'd like to acknowledge all the hard work of many people uh, that is summarized in this presentation, uh, particularly my students. Uh, and here you see the team of Sarah Amandrud and her field assistants and also the Bermuniad Working Group, which is a remarkable group of 50 researchers based in over 10 different countries. Uh, we have 22 sites uh, distributed uh, throughout the neotropics. And it's been a, marvel a marvelous group uh, to work with and to think through some of these issues. I'd be happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Dr. Diane, uh, for the amazing talk. I'm pretty sure that we have uh, a lot of questions and a lot of to discuss. Um, I'm going to the first question from Paulo Bezerra. First, he congrat, uh, congrats you for the, for the lecture. And he says, I found that to the topic very interesting. One of the problems pointed out by some researchers in thermal biology is to evaluate what is acclimatization and what is an adaptive evolutionary component in future scenarios of climate warming and ecological interactions. 
what, do, what would be the most feasible approach to solve these issues? And he sent you best regards from the Sertão de Pernambuco, which is a dry land, uh, dry area in Pernambuco. Did you understand the, the question? Yes, I, di I did. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. There's a bit of construction going on outside now. Yeah, now, now is okay. Um, so I think it's a matter of uh, um, time scale. So, um, you know, if it's a single organism that you're dealing with, uh, you know, th then they have the possibility to acclimate. Um, whereas if it's uh, multiple generations, then we're talking about adaptation, right? Um, but certainly we have to be worried about uh, in all of these experiments, like did we allow enough time for the organisms to acclimate to the best of their ability? Um, and, you know, it gets even more uh, complicated if you start worrying about things like uh, maternal effects and uh, uh, plasticity as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question from Thais Anata. Thank you for, for such an inspiring talk. Um, and then she asks, I would like to hear from, from your opinion uh, to hear your opinion about the use of meta webs to describe future interactions across different scenarios of climate change. For instance, by building communities based on species distribution modeling and inferring scenarios of future species interactions by current observed pairwise interactions. Yeah, I'm first uh, gonna just take a minute to close my window to reduce the background noise here. It's okay, it's okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so the, this, this is really interesting uh, point. So um, something I didn't mention about the Brominet system is it actually operates as a bit of a meta community. So the, um, the insects that occur in Brominet, of course, are there for their larval life stage, but then when they get to the end of their, that life stage, they emerge as adults. And those adults fly around the forest um, and then they, uh, of a posit in uh, other bromeliads. But they can disperse, obviously, and they can disperse even uh, you know, quite large distances. So um, when Melissa Guzman uh, was in my lab, um, she used genetic approaches to figure out the dispersal distances of uh, the damselfly. Um, and this is on down the coast of Brazil, by the way. Of, uh, so of the damselfly and of the tipulate. And um, you know, she showed that they went for hundreds of kilometers, uh, really quite surprising. Um, and even more surprising was that the tipulates went further than, dam than the damselflies, um, which has, I think if you want to take a, a meta web or a meta community uh, perspective, um, this has big implications for the type of scale we need to think about uh, in terms of the dynamics of the system. Um, you know, so species can move remarkable distances to avoid uh, uh, climate change. I hope I answered the, the question as I saw it. Yeah, for me, it seems to be answered, but anyway, Thais, mm -hmm. Zanata, is, if you have another question, she can, she can send in a QA, Q &A section here. Um, Pa um, Paulo Siqueira is asking, do you observe individual variation in the structuring of networks to a species level? I, I think I don't quite understand the question. Um, I think he is, oh, just a minute. I think he's just asking if you, can, if you observe uh, a lot of individual variation, intraspecific variation uh -huh. in the okay. networks. Uh, if this is a, a factor that is important for the for the for the community in Bromeliads and in your systems. Yes, um, you know, um, I think this is this is a really important question. 
And I think it's uh, something that actually um, we haven't quite got to grips with um, either in my 